abide in me as I abide in you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Yesterday, I had this fun privilege of, just after my four-year-old soccer game, going to um, go blueberry picking. I didn't realize that it's blueberry season, at least one more week here in Florida, and then it's going to kind of die down. But the beauty of, of going blueberry picking is that, well, you get to get like pounds and pounds worth of blueberries for your pancakes and whatnot. And it was just amazing to see this. I, you may not resonate with this whole agricultural reference that Jesus is doing where he says, I'm the vine and you're the branches. We do live in a, in a world where I guess blueberries just appear in these plastic punnets from Publix, right? But they're actually connected to this thing called a blueberry tree. That's what happens. So Jesus is saying, I am the vine, you are the branches. But did you catch what he says about God the Father? And my dad is a gardener. Like, have you ever thought about that about God? If someone asked you, what do you think about God? And that's uh, kind of what we look at in week one of Alpha. Like, if there were a God and you could ask anything, what would you ask God? It, or maybe you don't even believe in God, you know? Maybe if you're an atheist, like, God's just absent. God's not there, right? Or maybe if you're, you know, just kind of spiritual but not religious, the whole point is like, well, he's kind of distant, but that's about it. And, and if he is distant, the only way that he gets close to me or I get close to him is, is I got to do good things. I got to do the right things. I got to think the right things. I got to feel the right things. And then I will be closer to God. Or maybe you might not be that way, but you're, you know, kind of more like new age and the idea is like you see God as kind of capricious where you got to like say the right prayers, say the right incantations, and then, then God will, will kind of like pay attention to you. But if not, pff, he doesn't care. In fact, he's kind of going to be very like capricious with you. But look at what it says about God. God's a gardener. That, that's a weird kind of reference to think of God. Have you ever thought about his God as a gardener? But there's three things that we, well, at least three things that we can get from this passage of God as a gardener from verse 1, right? The first thing that God does is he gathers us. The second thing that he does is he grows us. And the third thing is that he helps us to go out. Well, he gathers us. My father is the gardener, and he gathers us, the verse, the, these verses tell us in 1 through 8. Psalm 80, verse 8, says this. It actually refers to a vine. It says, Israel, you are my vine, which I plucked out of Egypt and planted here. See, God gathers us. He, he takes us out of, out of the situations that we're in or the, the things that aren't helpful for us, and, and he transplants us. If you think about that, like a couple thousand years ago, maybe 4,000, maybe 60,000 years, we don't know, but some gardener decided to domesticate blueberries. People started domesticating grapes, and they started creating wine, right? So the whole point is gardeners gather their fruit. They gather their trees, their plants, and, and that's one of the things that they do. When you gather something, you nurture it. You protect it. You, you are helping it to grow into something that's beautiful. So God, the gardener, uh, I mean, think about it. it. Genesis 1, right? God, day 1 through day 6 as he's creating. Whether they're literal days or not literal days, it doesn't matter. We know that God did it. That's the important bit about that, okay? The whole point about that is that God's got dirt underneath his fingernails. He's a gardener. He's helping us to grow. And some of y'all might even be part of like a garden society, or some of y'all might even help put together these beautiful bouquets of flowers. And I know these bouquets are, that we have today are because of uh, the memory of uh, Reverend Barbara Longacre and also Marty Wheeler, um, who are both members of this church and beloved members. I, I don't have a green thumb. I have a black thumb. What do I mean by that? Like, so I touch a, I touch a plant and it dies, right? But I'm so thankful that God doesn't have a black thumb. He's got a green thumb and everything that he touches comes to life. So God gathers us. But the second thing that we see in this passage is that God grows us. Abide in me. See verse 4? Abide in me and I in you and you will bear much. You know, if I, if I asked you to grow a pile of rocks, how would you grow the pile of rocks? Well, you're going to get rocks from one point to another point, and you're going to start piling them on top of each other. Now, you can make rocks grow, but they're inorganic. 
They don't grow on their own. They only grow because something outside of them makes them grow. A vine, a living organism, we can see rocks are inorganic, but plants are not. They're organic. They, they grow because that's what they do. God brings growth to us. He's a gardener. And here's, the, here's what happens in this one, is that, you know, when I was walking up and down those aisles looking for blueberries, the blueberries that had gotten disconnected from the tree and sat there for two, three days, the ants had already gotten to them. They were starting to wilt in the Florida heat. Um, but the blueberries that were stuck there to the plant, some of them looked like, well, the ones that Sophia found. She had this like, little, um, my 14-year-old decided to have a competition with me, which I lost, by the way. Um, <laughs> The competition was who could find the largest blueberries. But, of course, she didn't bother to tell me that there was, you know, there was, the, there was like the, the farthing, there was the, 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 the meadow lark. Uh, there was all these different varieties, right? And then there were these other called the colossus ones, which is the ones where she went straight to. And I discovered they're called colossus for a reason. Because all the ones, like the farthing ones, which is like the smallest unit of, one of the smallest units in, in British currency 100 years ago, the farthing is pretty small. The Colossus were like an inch in diameter. So I lost, she won, finding those. But they grow. They, they grow these beautiful things. Uh, living organisms just produce fruit. That's what they do. Like, they don't have to say, like, oh, I really need to strive hard to produce blueberries. They just grow and produce them naturally. God, the gardener, wants to develop those things in our lives. He wants to develop fruit in our lives. He wants to develop things that are amazing and beautiful. And did you catch both in the Gospel of John and also in the Epistle of John, the first epistle, where it talks about abiding. Like you abide in me and I in you. Now, how many of y'all use abiding on a regular basis in your vocabulary, right? You, you probably don't. But here's one that might illustrate what abiding means. Um, hmm, cucumbers, right? Have you ever taken a cucumber uh, and then boiled it a little bit? Just a, a, You blanch it really quickly. Then you throw it in a jar with some vinegar. And then you just let it sit there for a couple of days. Is it still a cucumber? Well, yes, but now it's a pickle. <laughs> so here's what Jesus is saying. Go get pickles. <laughs> Abide in me and I in you. Just like, and the thing is like, because the whole point about, like, abide in me and I in you is similar to the language that we're going to use here at Eucharist. That he might live in us and we in him. Where, where does the pickle juice stop and where does the pickle juice start? Where does the cucumber start and where does the cucumber end? It's all just, to use the old theological term, it's co-inherence. It's, it's interpenetration. You don't know where you start and where God ends or where God ends and you start. Father, in chapter 17 of John, Jesus says, make them one as you and I are one. And think about that. It's, I'm the vine, you are the branches. We have been, we are branches and we, we draw from the sap and the nutrients of the vine. And the, and the, and, and the vine is, is getting all the goodness from the soil and we're feeding off of that. But the thing is like, how do I illustrate this growth or how growth doesn't happen sometimes, right? Well, I have a couple of southern oaks on my, on my house. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, uh, I hired some landscapers uh, a few years ago, and I said, hey, could you please, you know, give it a trim? And I looked at what they did to my tree, and I thought they brutalized that oak. I mean, I was like, what in the world did you just do? You just killed my tree. And then six months later, I looked at the tree, and it was beautiful. It was exactly what it needed to look like. Before, it was like this misshapen thing with some dead branches, because some branches were, they looked like they were connected to the tree, but they weren't drawing any sap. But when the, gardener, the gardeners came, and they chopped off all that didn't need to be there, and they pruned it, and they cut it, um, they did something beautiful. You see, God is a gardener. And what do gardeners sometimes have? They have knives, okay? Now, if I said the word chair, right, I could evoke a, a different image in quite a few different people's minds. Like, I could say chair, and you might think it's that plastic kind of, like, very 1960s fold-up chair. Or you might be thinking it's a beautiful oak chair with four legs and detailed etchings of, like, grapes and fig leaves and whatnot. Or you might just think it's a cheap old, cheerful pine uh, 
fold-up chair from China. But the point is, when I say the word chair, it evokes an image in your mind. When you hear the word knife, what does that evoke in your mind? You might think, well, oh, a knife, a stabbing attack in some urban city, right? Or if, if you're a surgeon, you hear the word knife, you're probably thinking scalpel. And so here's the thing that Jesus is saying here. My, my father's a gardener. He's got a knife and he cuts. But his cuts are not cuts to hurt. They're not cuts to kill. They're cuts to prune, to bring uh, more life, to cut the things in our lives that don't belong there away from us so that the things that do need to be there can grow and flourish. So that we're cutting out the things that we don't need to be wasting resources on so that we can draw from the real resources of the universe. So that sometimes the gardener will make a cut. Monk, did you catch this in our reading from Acts where Philip um, is walking on the way from Jerusalem to Gaza? And as he's walking, uh, there's a, a gentleman uh, from Ethiopia, from the, the court of Queen Candace. And he's reading the scroll of Isaiah, Isaiah 53, and he reads about the suffering servant. And here's where we learn about what it means to receive that life from the true vine. And it says this, uh, if you read it in a different translation, for example, the old authorized translation of Isaiah 53, it says that he, the suffering servant, was cut off from the land of the living. If you've ever seen, uh, I've never done it, but I've seen documentaries of where people do that, where they try to inject uh, a different vine or ingraft one branch uh, from one particular species onto a new particular uh, species. They'll take a, 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 a vine and insert that into the branch, into the vine itself. But they'll have to almost do a mortal wound, if you will. And then they, they insert it, they bind it together, and it seems like the vine is wounded, and it seems like the plant has been cut from what it thinks is its source of sustenance. But all of a sudden, they start sharing life and this branch receives all this life from the vine that's what's happening in isaiah 53 surely the punishment of our peace was laid upon him and the punishment that brought us peace was laid upon him he was stricken cut off from the land of the living we esteemed him not as one who from whom men hide their faces but he received the reward of his suffering. You see, Jesus, the true vine, has ingrafted us into the very life of the universe. And what do I mean by that? You've probably heard many people say, God is love, right? But here's the thing. What does that even mean, right? I mean, like, if we're saying that we believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, that means that before there was anything visible or invisible, there was nothing but just God himself. But it's before eternity, there was God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The lover, the beloved, and the loved amongst us. Now you can say God is love. Not just God is loving, but in his very essence, he is love. And so when you're connected to the life of the Trinity, when you are connected to that vine, you are going to start producing that fruit. So that's the third thing that we get from here, that not only does God the gardener gather us, not only does God the gardener grow us, he also helps us go. You produce fruit. You produce much fruit. Galatians 5, 22 puts it this way. It says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And wouldn't that be an amazing thing to have in your life for you just to be able to produce that? You see, you can kind of pile rocks and try to grow, have spiritual growth in your life by piling things, but that's not organic. But what Jesus is saying is, if you're a picker, if you're a picker, if you're engrafted into the vine, you're going to naturally, if someone squeezes that pickle, what's going to come out of you? Pickle juice. And so that's the whole point of when you're connected to the vine, you are going to produce that fruit of the Spirit. I am the vine, you are the branches. So Father, we thank you that you have connected us to the very life 
to the love that created this universe. We ask that we would abide in you as you abide in us. And send us out that we may tell others about this great love that transforms us and transforms the world. We ask this all in Christ's strong name. Amen.